It's great to be back with you this Sunday. I was out last week uh, down in Mexico with Impact on their missions trip in Ensenada. It was an amazing time, one of the best mission trips I've been on. Uh, this group just knocked it out of the park. God blessed it so abundantly. They spent two weeks really praying and seeking God. What do you want us to do uh, down there? How do you want us to minister? They really heard God's heart. And they really ministered in a powerful way. Uh, it was just a privilege to be down there. Uh, the heart really was for the, the church. They felt like the church was kind of weary. The leadership was kind of weary, needed to be encouraged and refreshed. And man, when we got down there, that was the case. And they put so many little loving touches into the 10 days they were down there. I think it's the most this group, this this leadership team in Ensenada has felt loved in probably a decade. They were so encouraged, so inspired, so ready to get back in the fight and keep uh, bringing the gospel to the people of Ensenada when they were at a place where some of them were thinking of just quitting, like it's not even worth it. Uh, so it's just such a great experience and so proud of the team and uh, appreciative of your prayers. Also grateful for Becky for filling in for me last week with all the kiddos in here. Heard it was a lot of fun with the scarves, and uh, I always love to get crazy when we have Kids Sunday with the kids in here. I know parents are a little freaked out because they're like, my kid's not behaving. I'm like, and George is making them misbehave. And I'm like, but I remember when as a kid, it was, you know, so often church was this serious, somber place where you couldn't laugh, you couldn't smile, you couldn't make any noise, you couldn't wiggle, right? Anybody remember that? Where you just had to sit there like uh, you like you were like your grandmother or something who was like 92 and, and didn't have the energy to move and and you had to be that at five and and you're just wiggling and then the big hand comes over you know and uh, especially with my brother and I sometimes we'd it's almost like when you're driving with your parents you remember that the hand of death coming from the back searching for children to crush um, and so I always love for kids to have a lot of fun in church, because I believe that's what heaven's going to be like. Jesus said, unless you become like a child, you're not even going to see the kingdom of heaven. And so I always love having the kids in, because it kind of reminds us uh, how our hearts should be and how lighthearted we should be in Christ. And uh, I want to talk today out of Psalm 133. Uh, Psalm 133 is one of my favorite psalms, and um, it's what they call a psalm of ascent. So it was one of 15 psalms that the Israelites would use uh, to sing as they were going up to one of the three feasts every year in Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem was up on Mount Zion. Uh, so all the travel up was always kind of an uphill journey, and they would sing these songs uh, to kind of help uh, motivate them along the way. And it's really one of the best descriptions of biblical unity in the whole Bible. And I have an illustration. I hope this is going to work. Uh, can I use one of these mics, David? Which mic should I use? This one right here? Yeah? Is that on? So anybody know what this is? It's a tuning fork. Yes. And what does a tuning fork do? That didn't work. That didn't work. Uh, did a little bit. Uh, let me try uh, the guitar. Whose guitar is this? Is this your guitar? It's Jane? I'm going to borrow this guitar. Is this okay? It's a nice guitar. Oh, hear that? Anybody know what note that is? Any guesses? Jared? It's A. <laughs> I didn't know that. Scott told me. It's his tuning fork. <laughs> With this tuning fork, we could tune every single guitar, the thousands of guitars in San Diego. I don't know how many guitars are in San Diego, but probably tens of thousands of guitars. We could use this one little tuning fork, and every single guitar in San Diego, if we used it to tune it, would be in perfect harmony with each other guitar. 
That makes sense? Just one little instrument. If we could just use this one thing and tune every guitar to it or every piano to it, every instrument in San Diego would be in perfect harmony. But say we didn't want to use this, we thought maybe my, my standard's better, and so uh, we're going to do that for our, and I'm going to try to tune a couple other guitars to this, and then down the road at a different church, they've got a different, different guitar, and they're going to tune to that, and then a different church has a different uh, guitarist, and they think their guitar is the best in tune, and so they're going to tune to that. Pretty soon, how if we all got all the guitars in San Diego together, and they were just tuned to different instruments near them, what would it sound like? It'd be just chaos. Nothing would be in harmony. So I want you to kind of hold this idea in your head about the necessity. You really want unity, harmony. Everything's got to be tuned to one thing. Everything's got to submit to one thing. If everything's going to be in harmony, it's got to be submitted to one thing. And we'll see how this works out in Psalm 133. Let's uh, read it together. I don't have it up on the, the screen, um, but if you've got a, a Bible app uh, on your phone or your Bible with you, uh, here's what it says. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down to the edges of of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon coming down on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded blessing forevermore. And we pray that the truth of this short little psalm would sink deep into our hearts today. Father, I know that unity is not something that comes to us naturally, it's something that comes down from heaven, it's your gift to us. It's the work of your Holy Spirit. And so I pray that today as we look at these uh, three verses and the possible implications for our lives, that you would cause these truths to resonate with us. Would you tune our hearts to your heart? May you be the one that we unify around. And we trust you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we start off with this first idea um, about dwelling together is both good and pleasant. It's both good and pleasant. And what does that mean? Let's let's take a look. Behold is this, this cry that the psalmist starts with. And the word behold means to pay attention. I'm going to say something really important right now. He says, behold, look here. Hey, kids, pay attention. You ever say that? Hey, look here, kids. Whoa, hello, right? Earth to my children. Uh, Pay attention. This is what the psalmist is doing right now. So I want you to turn to somebody next to you and say, hey, pay attention. This is important. (laughs) (laughs) And what's important? What is he saying is so important? Look, it says, dwelling together, united as brothers, uh, is what's really important. This is uh, the picture here. This uh, dwelling together means to sit down, to remain, to linger. This is what this word dwell means. It's not, hey, move to a particular neighborhood. It's more about sitting down face to face, remaining there for a while, lingering. Uh, Nan and I love to host, have people over to our house for dinner. And one of our favorite things are the people that linger. You know, after the dishes are done, after, uh, you know, 60, 70 percent of the people are gone. And then those few close friends that know, okay, now the real fun's starting, uh, you know, all the, yeah, we should have invited you over, people have left, and now the people you really want to hang with are left, and you just linger in the richness of those conversations, the, 
the specialness that happens as you sit at, at table together with others. And the picture here is really of this, um, this meal being shared by a loving family connected together deeply with bonds of love. This united, the word together means as one, united, connected to one another. As brothers in close familial relationships, sharing the same father. And, and the Bible says this is what unity is supposed to feel like. It's supposed to feel like a close family that has a deep sense of connectedness to one another, that when they sit down at a table, they want to linger. No one wants to leave. They want to stay and bask in the, the love and the fellowship and the glory of that moment. Uh, just a little side note, you know, we're coming up on the holidays. Uh, don't be one of those people that double books and leaves halfway through. Uh, there's just no point to that. Just don't go. Uh, don't show up if you're not going to linger because that's the best part. Staying and fellowshipping where you really want to be with each other in that presence, um, that regular overlap. There's something that's special that happens when we do that. All right, so here's this, this really cool picture. Um, the next part we get is that we're supposed to, uh, that unity is good. So we saw what unity was, it's, but it's something that's good. This dwelling together, this, this uh, close, lingering love for each other, it's good. And there's two words that the psalmist used. The first one is good. The second one is pleasant. And I think it's interesting that, that good refers to what it is objectively. Bible says that this kind of unity, it's good. It's just objectively good. If you rate it on good to bad, unity is good. Say unity is good. All right? And then it's also, we see, it's going to be pleasant, which is subjective. It's how you feel about it. It's something that's pleasant. So let's break down good for a little bit. Why is unity good? Well, the Bible tells us that only God is good. In fact, Jesus said that only God is good. Everything that's good flows out of who God is. And God at his core, in his very nature, is unified. Right? It reflects who he is. There is perfect unity among the Trinity. Can you imagine be there being strife, contention, division among the Godhead? No, that's reserved for the Greek mythology gods, right? That's Marvel Universe, right? Uh, but in the Bible, in the Trinity, there's perfect unity. They're always in one accord, always in perfect love, always in total agreement. There's never division, strife, or contention between them. When we dwell together in unity, we reflect the image of God to the world. I'll let that sink in for a second. The Bible says, we've been going over that in the, the Reimagined series, how we're created in the image of God. We're supposed to bear the image. We're supposed to reflect who God is to the world when we live in unity in that loving affection, that longing to linger, to, to bask in each other's presence. When we live that way, we're reflecting the Trinity to the world. We're reflect, reflecting the unity that God has within himself. Now, what does that mean when we have discord? When we have contention, when we have strife, when we have broken relationships with one another, what does that reflect to the world? Who does that? Who sows discord? So it's interesting. When we refuse to live in unity as children of God, we start to be reflections of the devil rather than our Heavenly Father. We start to project him out to the world. 
And so it's super important that we understand that living together in unity is good because it's tied to the very nature of God. It's who he is. And when we refuse to be in unity, we're actually rejecting the image of God in our lives and we're projecting something uh, demonic instead. So, but it's not just good, it's also pleasant, this subjectiveness. It's because it's so good, because it, it's so much the character of God, it actually brings joy, pleasure, and satisfaction to our lives. The Bible says in God's presence is fullness of joy. That's where then at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. See, when we're in unity, not only do we experience love with each other, we experience the love of God flowing through us. We're closer to God when we're loving towards each other. I don't know if you've noticed this in your life. You can't hold a grudge against someone and feel close to God at the same time because it denies who he is and the work that he's done. We are never justified holding grudges against anyone. There is never a justification. I don't care what they've done, what they've said, how they've hurt you. The Bible says that God's love and God's forgiveness is so powerful that it should extend into every relationship of our lives. In fact, Jesus says if you don't forgive your brother, it shows that you haven't received forgiveness from the Father. Because if you had received that forgiveness, it would be so overwhelmingly powerful in your life. It would feel like you've been forgiven a million dollars and someone else owes you 10 cents. Why would you hold on to that? You've just been cleared from millions of dollars of debt. Why would you hold a grudge against 10 cents? And so if we really experience the love and the forgiveness of God deeply in our souls and the freedom and the joy that that brings, we would happily extend that forgiveness because we want more of that joy, more of that freedom, more of that reconciliation, more of that uh, wholeness brought into our lives. When you experience that wholeness in a relationship with God, you don't want brokenness in other relationships. It's, it's a discord. It's a dissonance. Jerry, can you play two, like, totally harmonious chords for us? I know. He's, he's capable. Harmonious. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that beautiful? All right, that's how, that's how relationships are supposed to feel in the church. Now play something really discordant. Can you do that? <laughs> All right, it's just like, oh, it's just grating. That's what relationships feel like in the world. Thank you, Jared. Give him a hand. He's so talented. Um, and once you've experienced the beauty of that harmony, you don't want the discord in your life. And you want to let the reality of who God is flow into all your relationships. And you realize all these silly things that we're holding on to are causing us to lose the most valuable thing in our life, which is that harmony and that one accordness with God and his spirit. And so it's uh, pleasant, it's good. And then he gives us two comparisons. He gives us two comparisons. So the first comparison is like the oil upon the head. It's like the precious oil upon the head. And the second one is it's going to be like the dew of Mount Hermon, which is a mountain in northern Israel. So let's look first at this precious oil, uh, this anoint, and it's referring to the anointing oil. Um, we know that because it's talking about Aaron the high priest. And so it's a special kind of oil. It's not you know, olive oil or your avocado oil that, you know, is what, you know, $17 a gallon at, at, at Costco now. It's not that kind of precious. It's a precious oil because it's the anointing oil that would have gone upon Aaron, the high priest, to set him apart. So it's a specific 
picture that David's looking at here. And so it uh, it's, would have been poured out of a horn onto his head. All right, so that's kind of the way, it, it's not like this little dab like we do nowadays, right? It's a little dab and a cross. It's not that. It would have been poured out with a whole horn of oil on the priest's head. Uh, four to six ounces of oil. Uh, is anybody, was anybody here when we anointed Jeff uh, Doria? You guys remember that when we anointed Jeff Doria? And I thought, you know, Jeff's a special kind of guy, so I'm going to pour a whole anointing bottle of oil on him. And I think it was only two ounces. might have only been one ounce. It looked like a lot, I mean, because he didn't have a lot of hair. Uh, but it was just, it just poured down over his face. It was dripping down his shirt. It was going down onto his pants. And that was just one ounce of oil. And look at what the, the Bible, as we talk about this precious anointing oil, there's, there's four things that are, are significant about it. First, it's symbolic. Oil in the Bible, especially the anointing oil, is symbolic of the Holy Spirit's presence and empowerment. So as Aaron would be anointed, it would be a symbol that the Holy Spirit was upon him, empowering him to do the work of mediating between God and man. And he was going to be anointed to do that work of bringing people into a reconciled relationship with God. The second thing we see about it is that was that it was sweet smelling, a very powerful, distinct, sweet fragrance. Look at the, the recipe for it here in Exodus 30. It says, collect choice spices, 12 and a half pounds of pure myrrh, six and a quarter pounds of fragrant cinnamon, six and a quarter pounds of fragrant calamus, 12 and a half pounds of cassia, all measured by way to the, the sanctuary shekel. Also get a gallon of olive oil and like a skilled incense maker, blend these ingredients to make a holy anointing oil. So notice that this was not just plain olive oil. This was very fragrant, very powerful, very kind of an overwhelming scent. This was not a little, you know, eau de toilette to make Aaron smell nice. This was like overwhelmingly strong uh, fragrances uh, from the Middle East. Powerful, distinct, sweet. It would overpower every other scent in the room. Now think about that for unity. What should be the dominant fragrance characteristic of Christian relationships? Should be this sweet smelling unity that overpowers every other thing in our in our lives. That when you come into God's house, there should be this fragrance of love, this sweet smelling fragrance that permeates everything. It should be the, the dominant trait of our relationships. The next thing we see is that it's sacred. It's sacred. It set the priest apart as holy to the Lord. Uh, it was something unique and distinct. Only the priests were allowed to use this anointing oil. You couldn't use it for any other purpose than to anoint the articles of the tabernacle and to anoint the priests. So think about this. The priests were the only ones with this smell. What does that mean for us? We should have a distinctive unity that you can't find any other place on the planet. There should be a kind of love and connection and one accordness between believers that's not experienced anywhere else. One of my favorite things to do is to, to travel to different parts of the world. And it was fun to, to take the impact class down to Ensenada. Some of them had never traveled internationally. And, and to show up at a church where you've never met these people before. Some of them don't even speak uh, the language of the people down there. But immediately, if you've ever been on a missions trip, what happens when you come into a church family in a different, different country, different culture? How does it feel? Anybody ever been in that experience? Just a few. We need to go on more missions trip as a church. You guys, I need to get out more. Uh, we'll start planning some trips as a, a church so you can experience this. It feels like home. 
people you've never met before come up and embrace you and you, you feel an affection and a love in your heart that's unexplainable because that's the Holy Spirit tuning both our hearts to Jesus and making us feel like family even though we've never met before. I remember I was leaving after only being there for five days, and people are getting all teared. I'm like, I'll see you, Angelo. I love you, buddy. You know, and it's, you feel so much love for these people, and it's not something that you experience after five days of being at a job. You're like, peace out. It's done with you folks, you know? But when you meet people in the church, people who, who have the Holy Spirit in them, it's, there's this beautiful, distinctive connection that only happens in our, in our context. And then the last S is that it's substantial. It's substantial. This was a lot of oil poured out on Aaron's head. Four to six ounces. Imagine half a can of Coke full of oil poured on your head. Where is that going? It's going everywhere, right? It's gonna, you should try this at home, wives. Just get out the olive oil and pour it on your husband's head, especially if he has a beard, and see how it is. See what happens. See how that, how far that spreads. And this is the idea that it's not a little bit. This is the, the, God's anointing that comes in unity is something substantial. It's something that's supposed to be an overflowing, overwhelming, dripping out to the outer edges of your life. This unity, it's supposed to permeate through all aspects of who you are. It's supposed to drip down to everything. And that, that brings us to our next point, in the verse where it says it's coming down, it's coming down. This is the, uh, the Hebrew word yared. I think it actually is your name, Jared, right? Uh, and it means to come down, to descend, uh, to come upon. And look what it comes upon. It says it comes upon his head. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is the head of the church. He is the starting point of our unity together. And then it flows down his beard, the beard of Aaron. Uh, Jesus is our high priest, like Aaron was the high priest. And that unity flows out of his atoning work on the cross as our high priest. But it goes to the edges of his priestly garment, talking about Jesus' atoning work on the cross for our sins. This is really cool because... The, the Holy Spirit is, is represented here as this oil that brings this sweet fragrance of forgiveness from Jesus into our lives that's supposed to drip down into every other relationship that we have. It doesn't just stop with my relationship with Jesus. It keeps flowing down, keeps dripping down into every relationship that we have. This sweet fragrance of forgiveness. And I wonder, are there any areas of your life where the sweet fragrance of forgiveness hasn't dripped yet? Is there any area of your life where you've got some stench of bitterness, a little uh, funk of uh, unforgiveness in your heart towards someone? Jesus' forgiveness, his atoning work on the cross is meant to be like an oil that gets poured over your whole life, flows down from your relationship with him, into your relationship with other people. And I want to encourage you, uh, when the band comes up in a little bit to, to close us out, I want you to, to take a moment and just ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart. Are there any old grudges that you're holding on to, any bitterness towards any person, however small it might be, because it's supposed to flow into every area, bring that sweet fragrance of Christ into every area of our lives. So that's the first comparison. The second comparison is like the dew of Mount Hermon coming down upon Mount Zion, the mountains of Zion. So the first thing we see here is it's like dew. And again, this is 
symbolic again. It's symbolic of God's life-giving provision. Um, in the Garden of Eden, we were told that uh, before sin that there wasn't any rain, but the dew would water the ground every single day. It was God's faithful provision to give life to the garden every single day was, was what the dew was like. And notice it also settles. It's not like rain that, that's, that pours down suddenly. Dew settles gradually. It's a gentle, gradual progression that soaks and saturates everything. I know we kind of live in an arid climate, uh, but you've ever lived anywhere where you get really heavy dew, where it, it almost looks like it rained, uh, and everything, if you leave something out, it's going to be soaked. Uh, that, yeah, Seattle, right? Uh, what? In the redwoods, right? So you get that climate where it's just soaking dew. This is what it's talking about. And it's also sustaining. It keeps things flourishing. Uh, in Exodus, manna was said to appear on the ground like dew every day. And again, it's this symbol. Dew is this symbol of God's life-giving provision every single day. But interesting, where is it from? It's from Mount Hermon. This is Mount Hermon. This is a picture of Mount Hermon. It's in northern Israel. It's 9,232 feet high. Uh, so that's like 3,000 feet taller than Big Bear. Uh, it's a big mountain. It's got snow on it like nine months out of the year. Um, it's the tallest... And because of that height, it's right next to the Mediterranean Sea. It catches all of the moisture coming off the Mediterranean Sea. No moisture gets past Mount Hermon. In fact, if you look at, if you go Google it today uh, and you do the, the satellite imagery, you'll see green on the ocean side of the mountain and then desert on the, the, the east side. Uh, of that mountain because all the moisture stops at Mount Hermon. It catches all the refreshment, all the rain, all the snow, all the dew, and there's nothing past it. Dew is considered to be heavy, drenching dew. And um, I think it's cool. The rainfall and the snow melt from Mount Hermon are what feed the Jordan River all year long. The Jordan River flows because of the moisture that Mount Hermon catches. Um, the name Mount Hermon means sanctuary. Hermon means sanctuary. And so we see this beautiful picture that David's describing for us. And he says that that, that dew, that moisture, that rain, that sustenance that gets caught there, it's coming down upon Mount Zion. Again, it's the same word that was used for the oil. So this is the big repetition in the psalm. Three times this idea of unity coming down, coming down the beard of Aaron, coming down onto his robes, the dew coming from uh, down upon Mount Zion. Uh, Mount Zion's only 2,500 feet tall. It's little. It's tiny. Uh, I think my house in Escondido might be higher than that. Um, probably not. The name Zion means parched place. So in contrast to the sanctuary of Mount Hermon, the place of refreshment, Mount Zion's actually a dry place. Anybody ever been to Jerusalem? Just Nan? Just me? Oh, it's a couple people. Uh, so I think we're going to do a trip. You guys want to go to Israel? I think we want to do a trip in the fall. Uh, probably like, we could probably take like 40 people for this first trip. So uh, put that on your calendar, then, or just put it in your hat to think about it. Uh, maybe in the fall we'll take a two-week trip to Israel, or a 10-day trip to Israel. Uh, but you'll see when you get to Israel, it's, it's like San Diego. It's just dry in the summertime. There's no green anywhere. It's, everything's brown. Uh, Israel's kind of a brown place until you get where they start actually irrigated. Uh, it's not like the Galilee. It's a pretty dry place. Uh, but it's, all, it's an arid, dry place, but it's also where the temple was located and where the priests would minister. 
And so you've got these two contrasts. You've got Mount Hermon, this place that captures all the moisture, all the the life-giving refreshment. And then you've got Mount Zion, this low, arid, dry, parched place, but it's where the work of God gets done. And so as you think about your relationships, where are the dry, parched places? Where are those relationships where there's just no life, where it's been dried up, neglected, maybe people you have Uh, shut out of your life, maybe people that have hurt you and you've written them off, Uh, people that used to be close, but uh, time and distance has made that relationship just dry and it's withered into nothingness. This is where the work of God gets done. So often we think that the work of God gets done in the lush, high peak mountain places, where in reality, the work of God gets done in the low, parched, withered places. That's where God wants to come and do a new work. That's where God wants to come and revive something that was once dead. And so that's the hope for us, that as we look at our lives, at our relationships, anybody got any broken relationships lingering out there in your life? Just a couple of us? The rest of us are lying. Um, <coughs> We all do, right? We've all got uh, those people we've written off, those people we don't want to see, those relatives that, you know, even if they come, I'm not going to sit at the same table with them, right? And, uh, you know, the people we blocked on our cell phones, stuff like that, these broken relationships in our lives, that's where God wants to come and do a fresh work today. That's where God wants to let the dew of Mount Hermon soak into your heart. And bring a fresh, life-giving forgiveness. Let some love and some grace and some reconciliation start to bud and blossom and grow in your heart towards those people. It's not worth holding on to the hurt, the hardship, the unforgiveness, uh, the betrayals, the, the heartaches. None of that is worth holding on to. And the the psalm today gives us hope that it's not something we have to kind of muscle up in our own strength. It's not something we have to generate because it's something that's coming down from God. Anybody ever make the do happen in your own yard? We can't, right? All we can do is turn on the sprinklers and pay the bill. But when the do comes, that's free water. That's free refreshment, and that's what Jesus wants to do in our hearts today by the power of his Holy Spirit. Give some free refreshment to your heart that you didn't earn, you didn't work for, you didn't pay for. Jesus did all the work, and we just got to let that settle upon our hearts today. Mount Zion is where the Lord commanded blessing forever. Now, when you think about this, imagine how much moisture was in Mount Hermon. Do you remember that? How much does it catch? All of it. It catches all the moisture coming off the Mediterranean Sea. Mount Zion, how much moisture did it catch? Almost none, right? It just goes right over. So it would be this refreshment, what David is saying, that unity is like, the, would be like, if you had unity, it would be like the dew from Mount Hermon settling on Mount Zion. That would be surprising. That would be unexpected. That would be unusual to have that kind of dew, that kind of moisture, that kind of refreshment settle on such a dry, parched place. It'd be like saying, the, it's like the, the rain from Seattle settling on San Diego. We'd be shocked, right? No one could drive. It'd be just gridlock in San Diego forever. Uh, because we're just not used to rain. It would catch us off guard to have it rain. Like, how, long, how often does it rain in Seattle? Like 200 days a year? A lot, a lot right? It rains a lot. It would be like that kind of refreshment. But do you, can you imagine how green San Diego would be? The whole place would look like a golf course, right? 
It would be lush, it'd be green, it'd be beautiful in our lives. And this is the unexpected blessing that God wants to bring into our relationships by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is where the Lord has commanded blessing forevermore. Again, Mount Zion is this unique place because it's the place where Jesus, as our high priest, made atonement for our sins. Mount Zion is where the temple was located. It's where Jesus was crucified, just outside of city gates. It's that mountain range right there where all this significance is culminating in history. It's the place where forgiveness would flow freely from God to his people. This is the, the power of uh, this imagery that David is building for us. It's the place where we could be reconciled back to God. It's where everyone was commanded in Israel to go and to, and to be reconciled back to God. And today, it's the same call to us. God's saying, come back to Zion. Come back to my son. Come back to his atoning work. Let that atoning work be like the fragrance of forgiveness that flows and drips into every relationship in your life. Let it be like the dew from Mount Hermon that settles and soaks and saturates your soul to bring fresh growth of love and grace and forgiveness towards other people today. This is what life is all about. To love God and love others in a unified, unique way. And so, a couple takeaways for us. First is to behold. First is to behold. Take a look at your life. Where are the good and pleasant relationships? Where do you see God at work? Where do you experience that freshness, that goodness, that, that pleasantness, that joy when you're with certain people? And then where is it not? Where does it need to start flowing fresh in your life today? So the first uh, application is just to take a look at your life. Behold, take a look, see how am I letting the unity of Christ flow into every area of my life? And then the second is to, to sit and linger a little bit. Sit and linger. Let's be people that sit and linger and stop rushing off to the next thing. At Linger at Lunch today, Linger at Lunch every Sunday, that's why we provide it, to give an opportunity to sit and talk and build relationships, get to know people, meet people you haven't met before, and start to build that, that rich repertoire of loving relationships in your life. Ask people how they're doing. Ask how you can pray for them. Don't just rush off. I know it's football season and you've got your favorite games coming up, but they have things called, you know, uh, it's not DVRs anymore. Is it DVRs? It's just streaming, right? It just, it just all is kind of all, always there for you. You can always watch it. And actually the best thing to do, this is something I've learned to do over the years being a pastor and having to work on Sundays, is you can actually watch the game highlights and it takes like a tenth of the time and all you get are the best plays. And you get to all that wasted time, it's gone. Just watch the ESPN recap. It's like 14 minutes, and you get to see all the, the whole game, right? So stay, linger. Uh, get into uh, a, a home gathering and sit and linger over a meal. Every, every For us, it's every Thursday. You're welcome to come to mine if you don't. Lisa's not here today, so I can invite you all to her house <laughs> on Thursday. Uh, but we have just an awesome home gathering. We, we have a meal together. We have communion together uh, every Thursday. Uh, and it's the highlight of our week. It's where I'm building, built some of my best relationships uh, here at the gathering. And so linger. Um, as the, we come up on the holidays, think about people in the church you could invite to come linger. 
at your house, to come be a part of your family. Uh, don't just make it about your circle. Uh, invite some people over and experience that, that fresh uh, dew of unity, that fresh oil of God's love and grace in your life. The third takeaway is to then let the oil of forgiveness spread to the edges of your life. Let it spread to the edges of your life. In fact, let's have the, is the band here? Are they going to come up? All right. Uh, I want you to just think for a minute. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you, maybe convict you, show you. If there's any area of your life where you're holding on to unforgiveness, is there any part of your relationships where you're maybe holding a grudge against someone, where maybe you've allowed hurt to drive a wedge between you and someone else, where, and, and maybe it's years ago, uh, it doesn't have to be something fresh, but just an arid, dry, withered place in your heart where maybe the Holy Spirit could bring some fresh forgiveness. And on a side note to that, one of the things I've recognized is that people that struggle with giving forgiveness have, are often the ones who have struggled receiving the forgiveness. And they're, they're laden with guilt and regrets and shame and uh, the world comes and, and tells you that you've got to forgive yourself. And I just want to, uh, in all love and gentleness, let you know that that's not how it works. Uh, we don't have the power to forgive ourselves. If I did, I wouldn't have a mortgage today. I would just forgive it. Uh, <laughs> right? The debt we hold at when we sin is not against ourselves. It's against God and those we sin against. And so we need to secure that forgiveness from God, first of all. And that's what Jesus came to do. And it's really opening your heart and humbling yourself to be able to say, God, I need your forgiveness. I need you to wipe away all the guilt, all the shame, all the regrets. That can only happen from you. And so I want to encourage you as we, we sing this song to, to close if there's any area of your heart where you feel like there's, there's a barrier between you and God, like it hasn't, the, the oil hasn't flowed into every area of your life, uh, I want you just to say, God, uh, wash me clean of that. Forgive me. Take all of that away. Make me new with you. Restore me. Reconcile me 100% to you today. I don't want to hold on to this guilt. I don't want to hold on to this shame. I don't want to let my past be uh, determining my present. I want you to be the one that sets me free to be loved and to be loving. Would you just wipe away everything that's being a barrier and a hindrance in my life today? And let God's grace and forgiveness settle on your soul like dew today. Just let it gradually just seep into every fiber of your soul. Let it bring freshness in a, in a gentle, peaceful, gracious way. God's love isn't like this torrential rainstorm that's going to rip huge chasms in your heart. It's like dew that just settles and gradually soaks in until it permeates every aspect. You know, there's only one way that we can experience the kind of unity we've talked about today. And that's if we take the tuning fork of God's love and grace in Jesus Christ. And we all tune our hearts to it. If we try to be unified by our own perceptions, our own preferences, our own ideas, we're always going to be at odds. We're going to see that in our culture. It's always going to be at odds because they're not tuning their hearts to God's heart. 
Let's pick one standard and let's surrender our hearts and our souls to the, the resonant love of God through Jesus Christ. Amen.